Here you go. Sorry, I just got booted. I'm back now. Hopefully, uh, Charles, you can you can begin. Brian, can you hear me? I think we've taken. Yeah, that was my fault. Uh, my internet's bad here. Okay, so sorry about it, but... that. The internet is uh, a bit on the fritz here as well today too. So hopefully, if I Alexa. Say uh, shoots down. It's bad up, meaning it's good. Okay. Okay. So I can see you. Full slides, bigger. Okay. Hang on. How do you do the full screen slide? Okay. Got it. Hang on. George Washington University for my PhD, but before that, uh, master's at South Carolina and my bachelor's at the University of Delaware. When I was at the University of Delaware, that's when the September 11th terrorist attacks took place in 2001 in the fall. And uh, that's when I really became interested in Afghanistan. So it's been approximately 20 years. I've studied the country and followed it closely. Uh, my knowledge is purely theoretical. I've never been to Afghanistan. I don't have much of a desire to go to it now uh, anyways. But uh, I do know quite a bit about it. I've read a tremendous amount of literature on Afghanistan. So hopefully I'll be able to provide you with an overall assessment of what I see is going to happen in Afghanistan. and Taliban and the fate of Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban flag has the Shahada on it, which is the, uh, uh, the Islamic prayer, which is basically saying there is, uh, no, uh, there's only one God, which is Allah, Muhammad's the prophet. And it looks specifically like this. So it's basically an, an opposite to what you see with the Islamic state flag, which is the black flag uh, with a, a similar saying on it. Okay, uh, just out, uh, to state out front here, um, what we've all witnessed this past week is very traumatic, um, but Afghanistan is really somewhat of a, a movie of the week or a flavor of the month. Uh, it will, I think, uh, fade very quickly uh, from the headlines. This is a major issue right now in the United States because uh, it's, um, the Biden administration has taken a hit on foreign policy, but normally foreign policy does not factor into elections that much. Uh, even if it's a success or it's a failure, in my opinion. And I, I don't think it, uh, it, it's way too early to talk about electoral issues in the United States. But really, Afghanistan has always been a back burner issue uh, since even before 2001. It was really nowhere on the map. Um, so keep that in the back of your minds. Um, what have we witnessed this past week? It's, this is what I'll call a soft fall of Kabul. Uh, in comparison to what happened in Kabul in 1992 and 1996, uh, this is extremely peaceful and almost bloodless. In 1992, when the rival Mush today, and the other who I'll talk about later who city uh, for a long time they just rocketed Kabul back and forth and it was really Hekmetia was being a problem here uh, because they didn't want to share power uh, so they just ripped the city apart and you had an era of warlordism uh, which was just horrific human rights violations uh, crimes against humanity throughout the country 1996 when the Taliban or what I'll call the Afghan Taliban take over Kabul once again uh, very brutal, and this is when they pulled the former leader of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan out of a UN compound, Najibullah is his name. Uh, I'll get to him a little later. Uh, they castrate him, rip him to pieces, uh, pull, him about, pull him along uh, a motorcycle or a pickup truck, and then hang his body from a traffic post. I mean, it's really just desecration of the body. It was horrible see what happened to the poor man. But Najibullah as well was the horrible dictator who was in charge of the communist government in the late Soviet period uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, so comparatively speaking as well, when the Taliban take Kabul in 1996, extremely brutal repression. In fact, every major city that the Taliban took going back to uh, Herat, Kandahar, Masari Sharif, brutal repression, uh, slaughtering of ethnic minorities, as well as uh, repression of women, uh, e extremely strict interpretation of Sharia law. So 
what you're seeing now is a very much a soft touch Afghan Taliban, which understands that the international media is watching it very closely. I'm not saying that they have changed entirely, uh, but they've learned. They understand that they have to behave differently. So this sounds very strange to say this, but comparatively speaking, what we saw in 2021 of this past week is very soft compared to what happened in Kabul in 92 and 96. And again, we didn't have the technology or the social media to actually see it uh, transpire in real time. Um, with respect to what happened here in the spring of 2021, so Trump's out of office at this time, the Biden administration signaled that they were gonna fully withdraw from Afghanistan by 9-11, 2021. This to me is an extremely foolish decision. I'll get to that later, but it's, it has nothing to do with the date. It has to do with the context, okay? Uh, afterwards, the Afghan Taliban increased pressure. They stepped up attacks on the Afghan National Army and they began capturing the major population centers, which is specifically what my article talked about. Um, the Afghan Taliban's an insurgency for the most part, which was unable to hold major population centers. Once you start capturing the major population centers, you then have the ability to start calling yourself a proto-state and eventually a state. Uh, because you're controlling a population, you're going to tax it, you're going to provide it with services, you're going to be able to uh, use the resources to further foment uh, war in all directions. So this is what it's able to do. So as it captures cities, proto-states get much stronger. Okay, The Afghan National Army proved simply unable or unwilling to fight. And that's really what's happening, I think, in the Pentagon now, is who's to blame for this horrible assessment, believing that the ANA could possibly stand up and fight. Instead, it surrendered and fleed. This also brings up a fascinating research question. Uh, why, is, uh, why are occupying powers, or like the United States in this instance, able on occasion to uh, successfully stand up a local army? Um, we've done this before in several instances. Um, most recently, I'd say the one which has held the best is in Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are predominantly Syrian Kurds, uh, mostly trained and equipped by the United States Special Forces. Uh, it's a small army, uh, and it withstood a massive hit in 2019 from the Turkish offensive into Syria, but it's still intact today. Uh, but if we look at the Iraqi army in 2014, it falls apart at the onset of ISIS coming at them when uh, the city of Mosul is captured. Uh, the U.S. has to go in and basically help rebuild it. And now it's coming back, but I would still say it's, it's quite fragile. And the ANA is just disintegrated. Um, this, this has happened before in Afghanistan. So if, if you know Afghanistan, it's not much of a shock uh, where a national army will privatize or break to pieces along ethno-tribal lines. And this is what happened in 1992 as well, okay? <clears throat> uh, what you saw were several major cities, Herat, which is in far Western Afghanistan, uh, Kandahar, which is the spiritual capital of the Taliban regime actually, uh, and mazar sharif which is in the North, uh, close to the border with Uzbekistan. They fell very quickly in unison. So it was clear uh, to anyone who's observed Afghanistan that uh, the government was gonna fall. Uh, and then Ghani had to flee to country. I believe Ghani is headed for the United States. I believe he's in Oman right now. That's the democratically elected president. Ever since coming to power though this week, the Afghan Taliban has really made it a point saying we, we want a peaceful transition of power, amnesty for those who worked uh, with uh, the Afghan government, though I wouldn't trust that entirely. I think they'll mete out private justice in various different ways. Uh, Western governments acted very quickly to evacuate citizens, diplomats, and, and some Afghan personnel, but clearly it was a disorganized affair. Um, China, Russia, and Pakistan are all likely to recognize the Afghan Taliban as the legitimate governing entity of Afghanistan in the near future. Uh, they all have their own interests for doing this. Um, I'll talk about uh, Pakistan and China a little bit later. Um, but uh, here's something that is kind of controversial to say, but Peace is actually possible in Afghanistan now because the Afghan government has collapsed. And the United States and NATO are unwilling at this point to initiate a new military campaign. I don't like the ending of the war. I wish the other side had won. Uh, but nonetheless, Afghanistan's been at war with itself really since 1978. It goes back to a coup against uh, Sardar Mohammad Daoud, 
<clears throat> and then uh, the country goes under communist rule, rips itself apart with an insurgency that's sponsored mainly by foreign powers, some neighboring, some very far away. Uh, then you have warlordism after the collapse of that regime. Then you have the Afghan Taliban come to power. Then you have the United States directly intervene in a civil war on October 7th, 2001. And for the past 20 years, there has been at different levels, a low grade or a high grade insurgency, uh, which the uh, coalition forces and the Afghan government have been fighting against. So at this point, there's only one man standing at this point, and that's this Afghan Taliban movement. There's a bunch of other little radical Islamic groups which operate within Afghanistan, but there is no way that they could challenge the Afghan Taliban for control of the country at this point. And the Afghan National Army, as I said, has fallen apart, and there's no foreign backer at this point. So it's ironic to say that, but, but peace is possible in Afghanistan now. Pending the Afghan Taliban choose to govern in a manner which is more inclusive and much more softer than they did in the past. Again, not the ending we wanted, but nonetheless, it's an ending which you could possibly say at this point, the war is over. Um, why was it such a fiasco? It's an interesting question. <clears throat> um, you see, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures now of the, the poor Afghans hanging off the side of the military aircraft and some fallen to the deaths. Um, could it have been orchestrated in a more orderly manner? Yes and no. Um, here's a big problem with setting that date of September 11th, 2021. It's okay to set a date if you've defeated the enemy. Okay, and this is what we did in Iraq for the most part. From 2007 until 2009, 2010, uh, the Bush administration instituted a policy, Bush is out of office by early 2009, uh, where we surged troops and we changed our counterinsurgency strategy to protect the population, it was called. Uh, it's extremely bloody. We lost a lot of uh, American and coalition forces at that time but it did suppress Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was the lead piece of the insurgency. There were other pieces of the insurgency in Iraq at the time. We were fighting against the Mahdi army, uh, which was receiving tremendous support from Iran, but mainly Al-Qaeda in Iraq with the Zarqawi organization here was the main threat. We knocked it down to a very small number of people. A handful was left. We really had them on their back uh, with the American boots on their throat. So you could pull out in 2011 from Iraq, and it didn't look like what you just saw in Afghanistan. Um, that said, keep in mind what happens in Iraq in 2014, the whole thing falls apart. And that's because of a variety of uh, literature has been written about the bad governance of the Maliki regime. Uh, but the point I want to state here is the Afghan Taliban have between 50 and 80,000, that's an estimate, uh, fighters. And all the research that's been gathered on them shows it's they have an endless stream of recruits. So they're nowhere near being defeated in 2021 when the Biden administration foolishly announces that uh, America is gonna pull out by 9-11, 2021. Three things that does. One, it emboldens the Afghan Taliban to go after the cities before then so as to embarrass and humiliate the United States, which they've successfully done. It has clearly sparked mass uncertainty. You could see the people on the airport tarmacs, and it sparked as well military defections within the Nash Afghan National Army. So I, I really think that the Biden administration deserves credit for having the courage to say it's time to pull the plug on the Afghan war. I'll get to that in a minute. But I think the Biden administration is very much deserving of a lot of criticism on this issue. Uh, it could have been handled, I think, somewhat better, somewhat more organized. Uh, another issue with this war, as I said, it's always been a war on the back burner of the United States. Uh, and really with the Iraq war, when uh, the U.S. goes in in 2003, uh, they completely mess it up in terms of uh, going in with a small force, debothifying the society, disbanding the military. It, the U.S. creates an insurgency on its own actions. It is incredibly stupid why, what uh, the U.S. did. Uh, which caused just all of the focus to be on the Iraq war. And Afghanistan's completely ignored at that time. It, it's possible that the, the Bush administration in a second term could have possibly tried to include the Afghan Taliban into the Afghan government, but it was never discussed. That could have been a missed uh, opportunity. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, but I would argue that another big issue with this war has been who has profited from this trillion dollar war. It's the defense contractors, which tend to line around Washington, D.C. 
And contractors uh, don't really want to win a war. They want a war to keep going because they make money off of these wars. And what you're seeing now is in Washington, a variety of media outlets pumping out uh, anti-withdrawal ideas. Okay, And this is also the DC blob that Ben Rhodes famously termed. He's one of Obama's deputies. Uh, these are these think tankers and the revolving door who go in between agencies as well as quasi-academia uh, to basically push an agenda. And uh, one of the major issues now they push is this idea of uh, we, we have to protect women's rights in Afghanistan. That hasn't been discussed for a long time. Now it's become a major issue. I would argue that uh, I'm not so sure they're so, tr they're so sincere on such an issue. I think more of this has to do with money. Uh, because once you pull out, then there's no more money to be made. So uh, Biden has taken a major risk, I think, going forward in alienating uh, the pro-war lobby, which is in Washington, and the defense contractors who will throw money at candidates who support war. And this is one of the big issues, too, in American foreign policy, is why are the Republicans and the Democrats bro both pro-war parties, right? Uh, why, why do they both support a very expansionist U.S. foreign policy agenda? Um, the argument is it's, it has a lot to do with log rolling, which is which are these war lobbies within Washington, which profit from the war. So you could say war profiteering. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, the total collapse of the government in Afghanistan actually makes peace possible. A lot of people would say, well, wasn't there another way? Well, the literature on Brokering a peace deal between warring parties, there's a very high percentage of these uh, post-conflict societies which go back into war. It's called repeat civil war. Um, and the reason is it's a lack of trust and the parties are too weak on their own to actually, um, how would I say this, uh, fulfill their commitments, which further breaks at the trust. So. I don't think really there was any chance that these groups were going to work together. Uh, I think it was going to have to be one man left standing. And so it happens to be it's the Afghan Taliban that did that. So in some ways, I think this could have been avoided had uh, the Biden administration been a bit more organized with finding out you know, who needs uh, the visas to get out of the country, who, who assisted the United States or coalition forces. But again, this also shows that uh, Afghans don't vote in the U.S. electoral system. So the, uh, the main issue for a politician is they want to get themselves elected. Uh, the, these people aren't going to vote. And I think many politicians uh, would bet to say that in three to four years, no one will remember this. Okay. Um, then again, if, you, if there's another major terrorist attack, that's a different issue, but I don't believe that'll be the case. I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, I have another article that I published in Asian Security, which compares Afghanistan to Tajikistan with their civil wars, uh, and you know why does one why was Tajikistan able to get out of its civil war in the late 1990s, whereas Afghanistan's always been stuck in a civil war. So that's the puzzle, and it has to do with two factors. So it's a simple two by two table here. Uh, it has to do with uh, international support for either the host government versus international support for the um, uh, challengers, these violent non, uh, violent non-state actors, so violent extremist groups, you could say. Um, in cases like uh, Tajikistan, uh, so this is when Rahman comes to power and is able to hold power. Uh, what you have is really low or no international interference abetting a non-state challenger. You have some small groups like the, uh, the uh, United Tajik organization, okay, but where's their assistance coming from? a little bit from Iran, and they're using bases in uh, northern Afghanistan. Uh, but they don't have a, a, a lead backer, so to speak, a foreign power helping them. Rahman had uh, Islam Karimov in Uzbekistan, as well as uh, the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin. OK, so Russia and Uzbekistan were very much backing Rahman. They said, we want you to negotiate a peace. You're able to do it. So Rahman was able to get into this sector here, negotiate a peace. Okay? What you have today in Tajikistan is kind of spilled into what I call strategic advance and retreat, meaning nobody's watching it. Nobody's really supporting the groups against Rahman, and there's really no real organized resistance against him. Uh, it's more him just picking off people uh, whom he deems as a threat who used to be against him uh, back in the late 1990s, who were then invited into the government, and now we no longer trust them because the economy's tightening. He's getting older. He wants a dynastic 
succession to his uh, son. And uh, he's fearful of what's across the border in Afghanistan. Uh, but the Russians uh, really don't want to get too involved. They have a military base in Afghanistan, in Tajikistan. And of course, they, they help Rahman stay in power, as well as does the United States. Our special forces help train, uh, protect Rahman as well, I've, I've read. Uh, so he's in a stage where he can attack people, but then he usually withdraws, attack, withdraw. Okay. With Afghanistan, you go back to the um, Soviet-Afghan war or the war with the uh, uh, civil war, they called it with the Afghan Taliban versus what was called the Northern Alliance. You were in this area, civil war uh, for a variety. So in the 1980s, from basically 79 to 92, okay, you had high international support supporting these Mujahideen actors uh, in the Soviet Afghan war and very high support for the democratic Republic of Afghanistan from the Soviet union. It's when the Soviet union pulled its support for the DRA, that's the communist regime in Kabul, what you saw was regime implosion. Okay. So in other words, it lost its support, but various actors like the United States, uh, at the time had pulled it back, but Pakistan and Saudi Arabia in particular kept supporting the Mujahideen. So the regime basically implodes. If you want to see what a definition of that is, you can see the article. It's called Embattled Authoritarians. Uh, with the Afghan Taliban, they're fighting a civil war. Um, you have India, Iran, and uh, Russia supporting the Northern Alliance against the Afghan Taliban in the 1990s. America's not involved at this point. Uh, we were trying to build pipelines through Afghanistan at the time, foolishly, instead of paying attention to the threat growing with Al Qaeda. Um, and you had uh, Pakistan very much supporting the Afghan Taliban, as well as I would say some of the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, uh, but also you had this, uh, these Arab Afghans who were the Arabs who fought the jihad against the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan in uh, the 1980s. Uh, this is the group with Osama bin Laden, so it's Al Qaeda. Okay, that's where Al Qaeda actually comes from too. The base comes out of the Soviet Afghan war in Northwestern Pakistan. But what happens is uh, with September 11th, the U.S. intervenes directly. Pakistan is forced to pull its support temporarily for the Afghan Taliban. You see a foreign base overthrow and a regime which was on its back, the Northern Alliance, it was basically done, is able to swoop down the whole country and take it over. Um, so um, this is an important point, I want to say. The goal of the Afghan Taliban at this point, consolidate power, acquire international recognition become a functioning and fully recognized state. This is very different from what the Islamic State of Iraq of Iraq and the Levant was trying to do. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But I believe that this organization, the Afghan Taliban, is extremely brutal. It's extremely violent. It's killed a lot more people than the Islamic State ever could dream of killing because it's been around, around for so long. Um, and also, it, it just didn't get the news as much because the Afghan Taliban wasn't killing Westerners predominantly. Uh, whereas ISIS was uh, with a variety of terrorist attacks. And so this is a, an unfortunate side effect of how the media chooses to cover uh, certain conflicts. They tend to ignore poverty-stricken countries at times if uh, their own countries are not being affected. Uh, but I do want to emphasize this other point. The civil war in Afghanistan has really been going on since the 1970s, late 1970s. Um, the closest it came to ending was in early two thousand, in mid to late 2001, on September 9th, 2001, two days before 9-11, Osama bin Laden of Al-Qaeda sent two of his operatives dressed as uh, journalists to the northern piece of Afghanistan to do a quote unquote documentary on Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was the leader of the Northern Alliance fighting against the Afghan Taliban. He's a Tajik from the Panjir Valley region. And they had a bomb in the camera, so they, they blew him up. They killed uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud. At that point, within days, it was over. There, there was no way the Afghan Northern Alliance could have stood up to the Taliban. So the civil war almost came to a complete end in 2001 with the Afghan Taliban taking the whole country, but for September 11th. So once the United States gets attacked because of Al Qaeda, which has a base in Afghanistan, OK, that's when the U.S. goes in, overthrows the Taliban, chases Al Qaeda remnants into the Hindu Kush mountains. And then this Northern Alliance group comes and takes over. So what you saw just get overthrown in 2021 this week 
came to power in October, November 2001. It's the same nexus of people. Some of these guys have died, but some are still around, like Dostum is around still. Uh, Hamid Karzai is from the Popolzai tribe of the southern piece. He's actually a Pashtun, but he's the leader of this, uh, th this uh, group of people who really didn't get along. Fahim's been dead for a while. Uh, Ismail Khan's really old today. They're, but this group was all fighting the Afghan Taliban for a very long time in the late 90s. And um, they then are able to come to power for about a generation. Now they're the ones out of power. Uh, but again, so now since the Afghan Taliban have taken the whole country, there's actually a chance to end the civil war if they govern in a certain faction. I don't want to get too much caught up in history, but here's what happens in the Soviet-Afghan war. There's a military coup against a guy named Sardar Mohammed Daoud in 1978. It's called the April Revolution, Sar Revolution. Okay. The communists get out of prison, and basically the, the military, which overthrew Daoud, was trained in the Soviet Union, so they were indoctrinated with, with Marxian thought, and they let out the uh, communists, this People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. It's split between two groups, Parcham, which is banner, and Hulk, which means masses. Uh, Hulk is extremely violent, Stalinist, and want to repress the population, collectivize, get rid of Islam, educate the women. I mean, it just completely counter to what is Afghan society at the time, okay? Massive repression spurns this insurgency, which is led by these different groups. Some are nationalists in content, many are Islamists. When I say Islamists, these are radical Islamist groups, okay? Um, the Soviets then invade on Christmas, December 24th to 27th, 1979, to overthrow one particular guy, Hazifu Amin, who's the leader of the group at this time, they didn't like him, uh, and they try to quell the insurgency, okay? The United States, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, several other countries as well, I won't name, all decide to back these Mujahideen, these holy warrior groups, to fight an insurgency and make the Soviets bleed. And the Americans are really upset because the Russians and the uh, Chinese made uh, Americans bleed in Vietnam, so this is payback, so to speak, okay? Eventually, Gorbachev says, let's pull the plug on this. So in 1989, the Soviets withdraw. Three years pass, three full years pass, so 90, 91, and 92, okay, before this Democratic Republic of Afghanistan falls, okay? And it has to do with the cutoff of aid. Once the Russians and, or the Soviets, um, Soviets slash Russians, because it's the end of the uh, Soviet Union, and the Americans decide to cut off aid to their respective sides, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia keep backing the Mujahideen. So what happens is Kabul falls, Najibullah, who's the leader of the DRA at the time, he runs into a UN compound. He's in the compound from 92 to 96. The Taliban comes out of, the word is Talib, okay? So to understand where this group comes from, a lot of people now are saying, oh, it's the old Mujahideen. It's not. Uh, many of the Mujahideen are long dead, okay? These are some of the children of the Mujahideen, but what the Pakistani government did was on its border, it created a bunch of madrasas, Islamic learning centers, and many people were orphaned or became refugees as a result of the uh, Soviet-Afghan war, okay? Some of the leadership of the Afghan Taliban was able to um, hold on and continue to fight into the 1990s and even into the 2000s. Uh, but, and you could say they're a former Mujahideen, but many are simply the children of Mujahideen or orphans uh, who are educated in these Islamic learning centers uh, who learn this deobandist, extremely strict interpretation of the Sharia law, okay, in, in these madrasas. Uh, Pakistan supports this, this group in the South because it looks like it can actually win. And they want to build uh, trading routes up to the Central Asian Republics and dreams of pipelines from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan into Pakistan and maybe even India. OK, the Gulf states, as I teach in my class um, in the Middle East, um, they tend certain Gulf states tend to support uh, radical Islamic groups uh, as an extension of their foreign policy. And it also deflects domestic criticism of some of these ruling families. Three countries recognize the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. That's Afghan Taliban rule 96 to 2001. Uh, Pakistan, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Those were the three that actually recognized it, 
Okay. <clears throat> the Arab Afghans, this is uh, Al Qaeda, which comes out of uh, the Soviet Afghan war. It's a bunch of Arabs who go fight jihad in Afghanistan. They're predominantly coming out of the Gulf region. Uh, this is where Osama bin Laden's from. They go back in the 90s. I won't go into the whole story, but when they go back, bin Laden ingratiates himself into the Taliban leadership and uh, with money, but also marriage. And they provide a variety of really good fighters for the Afghan Taliban to try to win the war. So this is where uh, the Al Qaeda is like a parasitic organization which attaches to the Afghan Taliban because it needs a base of operations. So these guys like Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who plans the 9-11 attacks from within Afghanistan, they're, they're connected to the Afghan Taliban through marriage and also this, uh, this Pashtun Wali code of uh, protecting a host, okay? But they're not really sharing the same image. At the time, really, the Afghan Taliban doesn't have a fight with the United States. I wouldn't say it's pro-Western, but it's really not any American at this time. It's the problem with the US is Al Qaeda, not the Afghan Taliban. The issue is after September 11th, uh, the Afghan Taliban would not surrender or get or kick out Al Qaeda. So that's why the Bush administration says, fine, you're with the terrorists, we're coming in after you when they fight them. Within two months, because the CIA special forces and the Northern Alliance uh, were able to quickly overthrow that regime, okay? Uh, but it never dies. It just goes into the mountains, basically. Okay, so why did we lose? In my opinion, it is a loss uh, for U.S. Um, how we, and when I say we, it's royally, I'm speaking as an American. I had nothing to do with the decision making. It's just, it's easier to speak this way, plain speak. Um, why did we lose? Uh, the, the manner in which we defined victory uh, made it impossible to achieve. The idea that you're going to destroy a terrorist organization operating in mountains and caves uh, on an extremely remote and expansive area was a stretch to begin with. But to state that you're going to establish and construct a viable, legitimate democratic government without any Taliban representation in it that's going to be able to survive, th that's uh, pie in the sky thinking, okay? But that is what the U.S. government under the Bush administration ultimately formulated this policy towards Afghanistan. The Obama administration did not challenge it. OK, and really, I think Obama was in the position in his second term to do so. The problem was Iraq completely falls apart. And I think he was terrified to pull out of Afghanistan at that point because his legacy would have been further tarnished in terms of his foreign policy. Uh, Trump is one who is a one term president, but he's saying from the beginning, I want to get out of these forever wars. Um, he takes his time with Afghanistan, uh, but to Trump's credit, he did push his way towards making this a, an issue of a dialogue in the U.S. saying, why are we fighting this war? It's ridiculous at this point. The U.S. Is constant, was constantly uh, rotating the leadership uh, on an annual basis, and that's foolish in uh, any type of a war. Uh, you can read a book called uh, The Generals by Tom Ricks. It talks about how American military leadership functioned in the Second World War. Uh, you either died if you were a leader or you got fired. But this rotation so as to get more medals on your chest or more credentials is ridiculous. Uh, there was always an unwillingness to extend the ground war into Pakistan, which is where the Quetta Shore or the Afghan Taliban leadership was functioning, uh, because uh, the fear was we would further destabilize Pakistan. Also, you'd upset a variety of uh, pro-war business interests, which also provide Pakistan with weaponry. Uh, so you, you upset money interests in Washington if you do that. OK, um, so what I'm saying right here is there was never really a major focus to win this war. OK, um, the Afghan government that was created was highly illegitimate and corrupt. It's a bunch of warlords from the 1990s who have tremendous blood on their hands in terms of committing crimes against humanity and war crimes. But we had to work with them to build this, uh, this uh, quasi-democratic regime. Uh, Bush and Obama, I think, failed to make this uh, war effort a centerpiece to try to win it outright or to just say, let's cut the cord. So I think there's a lack of leadership from both Bush and Obama. That's a Republican and a Democrat for the Afghan war. I think Obama tried in the beginning to make it an issue, but then he pulled away from it. Trump actually did change the dialogue, but 
based upon the Trump administration's track record, my opinion would be it would have been just as disorganized uh, withdrawal or worse had he been in power. So I wouldn't say that Trump could have done this any better. Okay, main lessons learned. Elites need to fear state death to govern effectively. Uh, that's the Afghan elites. Um, this is a problem called moral hazard. They think that the occupying power is never gonna leave so they don't have to govern effectively. Uh, U.S. taxpayers, this is on us, uh, should not endorse imperialist projects in faraway lands. That's what this is. It's a form of imperialism to create a, a government which is alien very much to Afghan political culture, uh, which really Afghanistan's history, there's never really been a, a, a Viberian type state which exercises authoritative control throughout the country in its history. It's never existed. Okay. And this other issue, should the U.S. ever support these parasitic type governments? I would say no, but of course we do because it's politics, okay? Um, I'll talk a few more minutes, but this is something I wanna stress here. ISIL is not the Islamic State of Afghanistan. They're different, okay? ISIS or ISIL sought to overthrow secular monarchies, that's the Gulf, and authoritarian governments across the Middle East. The Afghan Taliban I'm arguing here, they're focused primarily just on Afghanistan, and every statement they've made has hinted at that too. Every public statement they've declared this week. It's a predominantly Pashtun-based group, so its ability to extend into Central Asia, I think, is non-existent, okay? And the, the nature of this group, it's extremely violent, okay? More brutal than ISIS, but its global appeal is not the same. Uh, there's a lot of news reports now saying there's a bunch of Arab Afghans coming to Afghanistan. They're flocking there. It's going to be the second Islamic state. The Afghan Taliban want to run Afghanistan and they want to maintain control over it. Okay. They're not as stupid, I think, as the Islamic State was. Islamic State never had a foreign backer. Turkey didn't fully support it. No Russian support, no Chinese support, no American support. You're going to get overthrown. That was, I think, ISIS's biggest mistake. They didn't provide, they didn't understand basic geopolitics. They were too revolutionary, too guided by their wicked ideology. They didn't practice basic politics so as to find a big boy who can back you up, okay? Um, the Afghan Taliban have good relations with Pakistan, Russia, and China. I would believe China is gonna be the first to recognize them and then very quickly Pakistan. And then a little later, I think Russia will do it. The Gulf states will eventually do it too because they like to use these groups as extensions of their foreign policy. And there's also concern about you know, throughout the Middle East, as I'll teach you my course now, the Gulf states uh, towards you know, the Obama administration, but also now Biden administration. Um, you know, we have massive military bases all over the, the Gulf area, but uh, the relationship has been strained ever since uh, the death of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who's the, the Saudi uh, citizen and also the U.S. Uh, resident. Uh, who was murdered in this uh, Saudi consulate in uh, Turkey, in Istanbul. Uh, so that, that has really changed the relationship we have with Saudi Arabia. And these other countries now are hedgings, like the Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Um, they all have a history of supporting these types of groups. So I think they will recognize them in time. Um, I would say this in the future, too. Groups like ISIS or ISIL, which operate Islamic State Khorasan in Afghanistan, I don't think Afghan Taliban will have any problem if US or Russian special ops go in and blow these guys up, uh, they will protest it um, because they can't come out and say they're working with the great Satan or you know, a foreign military to, to keep their uh, house in order. But my hunch is in the future, the US will continue to conduct hellfire drone strikes as well as drop bombs on various groups, which it deems as a threat in Afghanistan and the Taliban, Afghan Taliban will basically tolerate it because they also view these groups as a threat. That was a big issue with the Trump administration. He liked to just, uh, uh, I remember reading somewhere, he said, why are we even dropping bombs on some of these people? Just let them fight each other because Islamic State and the Afghan Taliban do not get along, okay? Um, the danger though is if, if it were to become a rogue state in the future um, or a terrorist haven once again, even if you did what we did with ISIS where you blow apart the cities like Mosul and uh, Raqqa, these guys can always just run back to the mountains into Pakistan. And that's really the difficulty of this war is it's to understand really the Afghan wars 
uh, it's, it's a fight between India and Pakistan, which really is the major issue of South Asian politics. Pakistan has lost the wars, or they've had a couple draws, you could say, you know, with like the Kashmir conflict in the late 90s. But uh, Pakistan is a, clearly a weaker power, I would say, even though it does have nuclear weapons, um, and it's always wanted to have more strategic influence. Uh, so I, I can never see ISI, which is the Pakistani Secret Service, decoupling itself from the Afghan Taliban. I don't think they have nearly as much control over Afghan Taliban as they wish they had. I think China's actually going to take a lot of it away. Uh, but what I'm saying here is it's, it's, it's easy to get rid of ISIS if they're in cities like Mosul. You just destroy Mosul, right? It's very hard to depopulate the, um, the mountains which uh, cross between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it's, it's not the same type of a way to fight this enemy. Uh, just one last slide. I've talked for quite a bit here. <clears throat> the word rogue state, objectively, that's a U.S. term, okay? Um, the Russians, I'm sure, view America as a rogue state. Uh, so who are the rogues? Uh, this is like uh, North Korea, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, Iran, Syria with Bashar al-Assad, Venezuela under Chavez and Maduro, uh, Afghan Taliban rule in the 1990s, early 2000s. Whether or not we call this thing a rogue going forward, it's going to depend on a couple issues. But really, what the Afghan Taliban are going to do is go for international recognition as quickly as possible. Okay. And I think they understand the risk of harboring violent extremist organizations. They should, because that was the lesson they were dealt with September 11th, 2001. I don't think they can really stop these groups from coming in, but I do think that they can let the special forces from other countries blow them apart. Uh, and really with technological advancement and the fact that the US has learned lessons of its own, I, I see that as how this is gonna continue. There will be a lot of bombs still dropped on Afghanistan to kill these little groups and some innocents will die. But for the most part, you get, I think, uh, the establishment of a, a hard piece, I'll call it, because the the brand of this organization's rule is going to be quite repressive. Um, I already talked about this. Uh, some other interesting things can talk about in the Q&A are Iran and India. India has always wanted a pro-Kabul government, uh, which would be anti-Afghan Taliban. They've not been able to get that here. So I think India is uh, strategically in a tight spot. Iran does not like the Afghan Taliban. Uh, again, Iran is predominantly Shiite. Uh, the Afghan Taliban is the Sunni movement. And also back in 1997, the Afghan Taliban killed a bunch of diplomats from Iran in the consulate in mazar -e sharif They actually almost went to war. Iran almost invaded Afghanistan in 1997. So there's bad blood there. Um, so the, the Afghan Taliban really, they're dependent on Pakistan and China and uh, to a lesser degree, I think Russia. Um, the United States and NATO cannot and will not recognize this organization as legitimate any time in the near future, especially if they roll back women's rights and maltreat ethnic minorities. Uh, something that's happened just geo, uh, politically, domestically in the United States and Western Europe over the course of the past half decade, so five to six, five to 10 years or so, is these two issues have become center stage. I don't think they necessarily determine American foreign policy, nor do I think they should, but they are important enough, okay, women's rights and uh, respect for ethnic minorities, that if you have an organization which is blatantly repressing women's rights and maltreating or slaughtering ethnic minorities, the U.S. is not going to stand for that, and neither will Western European countries, the NATO states, North American states as well. The Canadians cannot stand for that either. Uh, so this is an organization which is going to have partial representation within the uh, within uh, the international community, but because many Western powers uh, also have uh, a veto in the United Nations Security Council, it's unclear if the Afghan Taliban are going to be able to get uh, the seat technically. So it could be vetoed, I, I would suppose. Uh, this thing, has this affect Central Asia? Um, I'm, I'm concerned mainly about opium, but at the same time, opium has been growing and spreading all over Afghanistan since before 2001. The U.S. Uh, and coalition never put a dent in it. Um, the violent extremist organizations, that threat is always there, 
Okay, there's always the risk of a terrorist attack. You can do only so much to prevent it. And I think fighting a trillion dollar war for a generation is a stupid way to try to prevent terrorism. Okay, so I'm really not too worried about that. Um, the bigger issue, if I was a Central Asian, would be the checking out of America and the European Union of this region. Um, there's no hope for democracy if Russia and China don't want it. And there's also really no hope if the only quasi-democracy in the region was Afghanistan, and that's gone now. Uh, so I, was, I just had a coffee yesterday with an EU diplomat. I won't give the country. And uh, I said to him, uh, do you think that this is going to, how is this going to affect uh, relations with Central Asia? And more or less, uh, um, we both agreed, he didn't say this, but more or less, we both agreed that there are fewer and fewer interests now uh, fr from Europe and North America in this part of the region. If we're not there militarily and the security threat has minimized uh, because the Afghan Taliban want to establish more of a an internationally responsible regime, let's call it. And um, Russia and China are flexing more of their muscles. So th this is not ending on a high note, students, but my concern going forward is a, a more checking out and then the, uh, not the territorial integrity of Central Asia, but the sovereignty of Central Asia comes other, under further uh, pressure, meaning it's mother may I. You have to ask Russia or China permission before you uh, engage in any type of foreign policy activity. You could say that is already the case, but I think it can always get worse. Uh, so it can be a, a further weakening of this, this idea that it, these, uh, these Central Asian republics, they're countries and states and names only, uh, but more or less these great powers which have the desire to dominate the region further will exert more and more control over the region. So um, I think that's all I had for today. Yes, it is. Okay, so that I took about 45 minutes, Brian. No problem, thank you, Charles. Um, okay. okay, great. So there's a, a, there are a lot of participants uh, in, our, in our discussion today. So uh, it may be more efficient if you have a question, um, if you could put it in the chat room. Um, and, uh, and while you're doing that, maybe we can just take uh, one or two um, uh, uh, questions uh, from people, if you can raise your, your hand and, and we can call on you. Uh, and, uh, and while we do that, we can get the chat, chats filled up with questions and, and I can, uh, and Charles can handle a couple of those at a time. So does anyone have a, a question right off the top? Um, and for those of you who wanna put it in the chat, go ahead and do that now. Don't be shy. Okay, well, I guess we have a chat. So, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, uh, I had a question. So, uh, Professor Sullivan, you said that um, uh, it, it, was, um, it was pointless to continue this endless war. Um, so you supported the Biden's decision to withdraw, but um, how, could have Biden administration uh, acted in a way that would be, um, you know, less destructive and less, I guess. Stupid. So I think they could have, I, I do support the decision I've wanted to get out of Afghanistan for quite a long time. Um, and people looked at me crazy thinking that, but to me, it's a, it's a pointless war. There was no way to win it uh, because you couldn't defeat the Afghan Taliban and there was no desire to extend the war into Pakistan. I'm not saying that would have been a good idea either, but if you wanted to end the war, you would have had to do something of that magnitude or split the country in half. And nobody seemed to want to do that because it further undermines the territorial integrity norm, sovereignty, and nation principle. So what the Biden administration could have done Again, it's a democracy, so it's hard to do this, but what the Russians would do in the Soviet-Afghan war is they increase their, their military campaign so as to try to push the Afghan Talib or the Mujahideen back. And war in Afghanistan has fighting seasons. It goes at certain times of the years uh, because the mountain, the mountain passes in the, uh, along the border 
the, the snow blocks them, basically. They become unnavigable, impassable. Uh, so they could have timed this better, I believe, uh, and done a pullout in a manner which was more um, uh, organized when, when the enemy was on its back foot somewhat because of, because of weather or because it was being really bombarded. Um, but the main issue here, which I want to stress again, is the Afghan National Army. Somebody in the Pentagon gave the OK and said this army can stand on its own. Somebody told Biden that, I believe. So whoever did that deserves to be fired. That's a fireable offense. Um, this is a big issue going forward. How does the United States, if it ever wants to do this again, understand that it can uh, walk away from standing up an army, standing up an army, and it actually stands itself up, meaning it, it holds on its own volition? Obviously, that was incorrect. Okay, so if you were going to leave Afghanistan, um, you would have had to really obliterate the, the uh, Afghan Taliban to, or put it on its back foot. This notion that you could have negotiated a peace, I don't think it would have worked either. Um, you would have had to build up the Afghan army more, but how, mu how many more decades and how many more trillions you want to spend doing that? Okay, so the other option then is, you know, possibly in this, maybe Biden knew it, he's not as you know, misinformed as we thought he was, maybe he just said, this is going to suck anyway, it's going to fall apart, and let's let it go. And he's going to take the blame for it. I mean, there's always been rumors Biden's too old to be a two term president, he just wants out of the war as well. So maybe that's it. Uh, but personally, I think it's irrespective, uh, whether or not it's a, a slow withdrawal or a fast, I thought Kabul was going to collapse anyway. So I'm not, I'm not shocked at the end result. I'm a little shocked just at the, the traumatic experience of seeing it go so quickly. It's a humiliation. It's an embarrassment. Um, you know, the, the notion, though, this is the end of American superiority, I think, is a, it's a bit ridiculous. The, the people in Afghanistan who win these wars, they always say that. We defeated the Soviet Union. No, you didn't. And I, I don't think the U.S. is going to fall apart over uh, what just happened this week. Okay, uh, so we have a, uh, maybe we'll, um, Ilias, maybe you can uh, um, ask your question and then others, please uh, put your questions in the chats um, and we'll try to fill it up uh, and, and we'll do that. So Ilias. Yeah, Dr. Sullivan, thank you for your presentation. And I just wanted to ask a question related to the sovereignty of Central Asian nations. As uh -huh. I remember in one of our courses, we read the article about the strategy that Kazakhstan should use. I mean, the recovery of the multi-vector politics and increase of the Western influence in the Kazakhstan. But now when Afghanistan has fallen and you just said that uh, most probably unite, uh, EU and America will not have further interest in Central Asian region, are there any, uh, how to say it, possibilities for the recovery of the multi-vector politics or is it over for Kazakhstan? In my opinion, multi-vectorism has been over for a while. I think it's a farce that your regime uses so as to generate domestic legitimacy to say they're doing something. Um, if I was in power in Kazakhstan, I, I'd forget mostly about the U.S. at this point and be more interested in trying to cultivate good relations with the Germans, the South Koreans, the Italians, the Dutch, as well as the, the UAE, Qatar, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You're, you're looking more for middle powers at this point. Really, the, the U.S. being a superpower, it's just not interested in this part of the world. It's too far away. You, you have too much Russian cultural, linguistic, religious, you know, li, um, there's political, military, and economic as well influence over the region. There's just not enough interest. And also keep in mind, there's only 19 million of you guys, right? So how many Kazakhs are running around Washington, D.C. as a pro-Kazakh lobby? There's, there's none, okay? Tajikistan doesn't have a lobby in D.C. Neither does Kyrgyzstan or uh, Turkmenistan. Of course, they don't have a lobby. So if you don't have a lobby, you don't have a voice in Washington. The, you know, money is honey. That's, that's what matters. So as long as you don't have that, you're... you're it's fruitless to try to cultivate relations, I think, with uh, Western powers. I mean, really, if you want to take a look, you could see who were these, uh, these agents, these various groups, uh, we call them foreign agents, 
Uh, they have to be disclosed publicly to the U.S. government. So we have lists of them. You can just Google it. You'll see it. Uh, Central Asian republics have almost no representation in Washington, D.C. Uh, but certain countries like the Kurds in northern Iraq, who well, they got oil, but they, they're smart. They, they have a lot of influence. Okay, The Israelis, a lot of influence. Um, there's a variety of countries like that. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, a lot of influence. So it's going to affect American foreign policy. We, we just, not to you know, sound crude, but we just don't care about Central Asia. It's not important. So I would say if I was in power in Central Asia, you're looking to multi-vector in directions that are not looking at other superpowers. So I'd be looking at the middle powers. Um, so you. we have a, thank you for that question. Um, so let's go to the chats. Um, Mere Ozat, uh, could you please analyze the motivations of American withdrawal a bit more? Um, uh, what, what, what do you suspect the, the, the many reasons for that are? One is money. Okay, this costs a lot. There's, you know, everyone now is saying, was this worth it? I think that's a, a bad question to ask when you've lost faith in the mission. And, and the, the odds are against you because you're not gonna like the answer. Uh, but could you please analyze the motivations? The American public is not vested in this war. We're not really invested in the war because there, there is no conscription, there's no draft, okay? Uh, so 1% of the population has been fighting it. A small group of, of lobbyists and uh, contractors have made a, a fortune off of the war, uh, but I think everyone in Washington and the Pentagon knows that this war is a loser. They know what the Afghan government is. Uh, they know that you can't economically transform this country off of opium. It's a, it's a very poor country and it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's extremely far away. So at this point you ask yourself, what are you fighting for? And the old argument was, well, there may be another September 11th. Yeah, maybe, and maybe not. That's the whole point of, you know, you have to live with risk. And I think there's a risk that anything could happen in the international system at any given moment. And this notion that there's going to be a repeat 9-11 attack coming out of Afghanistan, I think is the odds of that are so low that the, the administration says we have to live with this risk. Otherwise, we're going to spend trillions and trillions of dollars and spend more decades in here propping up, you know, uh, a sandcastle, which is going to fall over at the first wave that hits it. And that's, that's basically what happened here. So it's, it's not that the U S was defeated. The U S just said, this ain't worth it anymore. And that's the whole history of Afghanistan. The Mujahideen like to say we defeated the Soviets. No, they didn't. The Soviets won every major battle. Okay. The Soviets just said, this ain't worth it anymore. And the uh, the British, when they had their little Anglo-Afghan wars, it's the same thing. They didn't destroy these empires or these states. It's just it wasn't worth it. And as I said, Afghanistan is a, a movie of the week, a flavor of the month. It'll disappear from the international headlines soon enough. Uh, next question. Brian, I can just read these. Okay, go for it. Looking at good U.S.-Kazakhstani relationships, would U.S. support Kazakhstan? No, of course not. <laughs> I say in my class, if, if the Americans invade Kazakhstan, Russia will protect you, okay? If uh, China invades you, Russia may help you or they may rip you in half like what happened with Poland in 1939 with the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. And if Russia invades you, nobody's coming to help you. So you're, you're in a tough position, uh, but it could always be worse. I mean, there's other places which have been ripped apart and never been rebuilt. So this is part of the deterioration of the territorial integrity norm, the sovereignty of nations principle. This really starts with Kosovo in the, the war in Serbia in the late 90s when the Americans say we have to go in and get rid of uh, Milosevic uh, because he's ethnically cleansing Albanian Muslims in the south part of Serbia. And the Russians said, no, this is not a good thing to do. So right there, the Russians stand for sovereignty and the Americans don't. We stand for the right to protect. But then there's other cases like Ukraine, the Americans stand for sovereignty and the Russians stand for right to protect ethnic Russians. Okay, so really since the late 90s, this whole thing has become jumbled. And if you're a weak state, and that's, I'm sorry to say this, that's what Kazakhstan is. It's, it, it doesn't have the ability to project power far. 
It really doesn't. There's only two or three countries in the world that can do it. I don't want to upset our European colleagues, but really there's only one or two European countries which can project power far. I'd say that's the French and that's the British, um, but the rest of them, not really, no. Um, so with Kazakhstan, now that they're even weaker. It, Kazakhstan is not a middle power. So you have to be very careful with a soft touch in everything you say and do. And really it's my understanding of Kazakhstani foreign policy now is uh, you have to ask Moscow for permission before you initiate a foreign policy. And that's just a hard fact of geopolitics. Um, to what extent, next question. To what extent does POTUS have to support? Uh, no, Bi Biden's independent. I don't think anybody really controls Biden. He's too damn old and he, I don't think he'll run for a second term. So in a sense, uh, we like to say a, a, a two-term president in the second term is a lame duck. Uh, they're really just shooting for legacy. They, you can't really control them as much. I think, I think Biden's already a lame duck because he's going to be a one-term president. So I don't see him being controlled by, definitely not controlled by Trump and definitely not by uh, Obama when he was vice president. Uh, this question may have something to do with Trump starting to move towards, um, you know, uh, wanting to get out of Afghanistan and then Biden had to stick to it. No, I think Trump's foreign policy was extremely dysfunctional. Uh, to be honest, certain policies he did foreign policy, I was okay with the end result of it, but the manner in which he got from A to B was just, it was a roller coaster of dysfunction. So I don't think the Biden administration in any way is beholden to the Trump administration's foreign policies. And, and that's a good thing. Um, so rarely is this ever an issue. Once you get a new president, the new president really doesn't have to be connected to it. Uh, and really, the, the war on terror is not like the Cold War, where there is one particular doctrine like containment, which spans across multiple presidents, right? The, this is, uh, it, it's only four presidents, Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. And I, I would say that you know, from the early, from the mid Bush presidency, the Democrats were saying, get out of Iraq. And you know, what's it called? Did that Obama, but then he has to go back in with the war against ISIS. And when Trump's running for office, he's saying, get out of these wars as well. So I I've seen more of a desire to get out of the wars than to stay in them from the men in office. But once they get in the, the defense lobby then says, no, you ain't going anywhere. Thanks for the lecture. What do you think about the possible increase in dependence on cent Central Asia, on Russia, with the growth of national security risks associated with? Um, the bigger issue is Afghanistan, I think, is going to become quickly dependent on China uh, because China is going to want to do the Belt and Road with post-war reconstruction, and they're going to want to get the, the Afghan Taliban in debt to them. That's, that's the Chinese trick. OK, debt trap diplomacy. And then Pakistan's going to realize that China is not a friendly neighbor so much. It, it wants more than it's giving. Um, Russia is mainly interested in preserving some type of a zone of influence over Central Asia. And the problem is, is the further you go down south, less, speak, less people speak Russian and you have very few Orthodox uh, Christians. So the further and further you go down, really, Russia is just dependent upon military influence at that point. And they have a little bit of influence in Turkmenistan, which is neutral. Uh, but the, the Russians have been in Turkmenistan uh, recently helping out so as to fortify the border patrol. Uh, and they have some influence in Tajikistan as well. Uh, but keep in mind, too, uh, the, many of these regimes in Central Asia are highly parasitic. And the Russian government knows that. Uh, you're dealing with a mafia state in Tajikistan and uh, more or less in Turkmenistan as well. So I don't see uh, massive interest of Russia in those two countries as much. I think Russia would be interested in seeing it, making sure the borders are protected. But Russia's really interested, I think, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan uh, because Uzbekistan is one which has been flirting with trying to multi-vector and Kazakhstan's got uh, the best economy in the region. Uh, but I, I just see his more and more. I'm, I think the Russians will uh, tighten the ranks around Kazakhstan going forward.
I mean, what I think is eventually going to happen in Belarus, a union state. So it's like an Anschluss of 1938 with Germany and uh, Austria, where, uh, you know, Lukashenko serves out as president of Belarus, but uh, Putin basically gets a new role. And then eventually, I think uh, Kazakhstan gets sucked in, not in a union state, but uh, you, they'll build some type of a Eurasian Union parliament and they'll start pushing a common currency and eventually you'll get sucked into it. I don't think there's any way to stop that. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean Kazakhstan is going to decline. It, it just means, you know, your perspective, what do you think is most important? You know, and if you really believe that your borders are most important, I, I think you'll keep your borders, which is a good thing, but your, your influence over making the foreign policy decisions. No, I think that, that disappears. Um, so this situation goes in line with the pandemic and there are already decisions upon cutting funding from IMF and other organizations. I don't think the IMF will back the Afghan Taliban. So we're supposed to support the region during COVID-19. What do you think are future steps of it in IMF and supporting the region's populations? They decide to cut the funding besides, uh, hang on, certain political consequences, especially in the region. How do you think the are making their decisions? Um, Okay, this is a bit of a difficult question. I'll just be very brief on this one. Um, the pandemic for the most part is over, boys and girls. This is as good as it's gonna get. We got a vaccine, okay? Um, we're, this thing is not going away. It's gonna keep growing in different variants. Um, every one of us is gonna have to decide you know, what, what is worthy of life or risk? I mean, my wife is from Russia and we're debating whether or not to go to Russia where it's a bunch of unvaccinated people. And most likely I'm getting on the plane in October to go see my wife's family because it's family and I'm going to take the risk. Okay, it's a risk, but I'm going to take it. This notion that you can control this thing at this point, um, I, I don't see it going away. So th this, what else can the international community do? Everybody knows to wear a face mask. There's vaccines available. People understand how this disease spreads. So at this point, uh, help doing what, right? If the hospitals are filling up again, it's because people are doing certain things which they know they shouldn't be doing anyway, uh, or they fall sick, unfortunately, right? But if they're filling up, it, it means people aren't social distancing. So. I, I don't have the answer to get out of this, but I, I do believe this is the end of the pandemic. The interesting thing is when at NU we all get to come back uh, because eventually we're going to have to all come back. Uh, that uh, Otherwise, I don't see this as being viable long term. So we got to eventually get back. But this notion that this thing is going to just disappear if we throw enough money at it or if the IMF somehow comes up with it. I'm sorry. I don't think Joe Biden's going to put the world back together like it was in 2019. Um, what is the motivation for Russia and China to support or be neutral about the Afghan Taliban? Um, so with uh, China, it's easier. They want to, China needs a zone of influence. And since they're a late bloomer, uh, they don't really have a strategic part of the world that's open. Uh, East Asia is very much like a U.S. hegemonic domain. Korea, Japan, right, Taiwan. Okay, so if you want to get that area, you're going to have to fight the United States. And those are areas the U.S. ain't going to give up, okay? Um, you know, parts of uh, uh, Asia Pacific, this is a big issue with Australia right now. Um, these uh, little island countries, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, uh, the Chinese are coming in and trying to buy them up, basically. And Australia is asleep at the wheel. They're, they're just waking up to this. Um, so you got some island nations, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, North Korea, uh, some uh, African countries uh, which have fallen victim to debt trap diplomacy. Uh, Kenya is one of these. Uh, Zambia is another one. Uh, and then you have a couple uh, European countries like Montenegro, which have been sucked into it as well. Uh, but China's having a hard time figuring out where it can have like its sphere. Okay. Uh, so with Afghanistan, uh, they'll be able to extend around Central Asia, so bypass it for the most part if they want, pending it stabilizes. 
and uh, be able to extend these uh, trade networks that they want to get across into Eastern Europe. Uh, Iran as well has been horribly affected by the coronavirus. So a bunch of the Ayatollahs have died off because they were old to begin with. And uh, the IRGC, which is a terrorist organization, according to the US government, that's Soleimani's group, uh, runs the country for the most part. Now they're very close with the Chinese government. Uh, but it would keep in mind, China is very close with the Gulf states too. China is very smart in playing both sides of the street. So as to try to maintain warm relations with as many countries as possible. The relationship with the United States though is extremely hostile. Uh, this is the Uyghurs, this is Hong Kong. And of course, this is the pandemic as well. And it's uh, recent statements about Taiwan as well. Um, with Russia, it's less of an interest. Uh, Russia has a good relationship with the Afghan Taliban because they've been supplying them with weaponry to kill American and coalition forces. Uh, but, you know, I, I recently had lunch with a guy uh, who's a former gen, uh, not a general, colonel, when I was in the U.S. And I asked him, are we at war with Russia? And he said, yes. And I said, when did that start? And he said, I don't know. It's, it's, it just happened. And uh, we kind of agreed since 2014, the United States has been in some type of a state of war with Russia. Uh, economic sanctions are a form of warfare, you could say. But really, I think uh, the coup against Yanukovych, which I believe was Western sponsored, late leads to Crimea and eventually Donetsk. And then you have the sanctions and then you have the election, the electoral meddling, uh, the Syrian war, uh, you know, j just multiple fronts. The U.S. and Russia are going at it. And Afghanistan got sucked into this as well. And at this point, Look, the Russians are always interested in finding new areas to, to swallow up so they have more influence. Um, so why not get along with these guys? Why not at least try? The Russians are very good in terms of geopolitics. Russia is not guided by any type of ideology. And really, that, that's a problem with American foreign policy. Um, I don't mean to discredit certain issues like human rights or women's rights or democracy. I believe in these issues. But as a real politique thinker, it's foolish to, go, to engage in international relations with these things at the forefront of your prefrontal cortex. If you do that, um, you're going to get in fights with big powers very quickly. That's in the 1990s. This is what, this is what sets the stage for what we're dealing with today. Um, so I would say it, Russia, Russia is very much a, a cool headed, but, re, but fading power trying to preserve some type of influence and it's got a tremendous amount of weaponry but it doesn't have um um the economy so as to push its weight around like china or the united states does at this point uh, i think i'm at the uh, maybe a stupid question but why the situation in afghanistan can threaten the diplomatic relations of kazakhstan so much uh kazakhstan is comparatively secular country um oh boy there's a lot more questions okay hang on a sec one sec uh, I got that. What is the motivation for Pakistan? Also pipelines. So, um, all right. So with the Pakistan issue, keep in mind too, when I say Afghan Taliban, that's a general way to put it. It's better to call them Talibans. There's a whole bunch of these groups. One of the most amazing things with the Doha talks was that the leadership uh, was actually somehow able to, to coalesce and get everybody to follow suit and stop shooting for a bit with a ceasefire. Um, this is an issue with how the Afghan Taliban is going to be able to govern. Uh, that, that's, I recently saw a quote, it's easy to take Kabul, it's hard to govern it. Uh, so we're going to see if they're actually able to do that. What is Pakistan interested in? So let me shut this for a sec. Hang on one second. I'll, I'll give you a map if I can. Uh, save. Okay, so... You see, uh, in the Soviet-Afghan War, this is where President Zia al huq who was a military dictator, he had all these madrasas here. You had all the passes going in where the Mujahideen would cross over to fight in Afghanistan. Okay, um, so his goal was basically we don't want to be surrounded by uh, um, a pro-Indian regime. I think we can see the map. Oh, you can't see the map. We can. No, now we can. Okay, we you guys can, can see. Yes. It. Okay. So with India, when, um, when Zia comes to power, 1977, I believe that's when they killed Zulfikar Bhutto, Benazir's father. 
Uh, Zia comes to power. It's a dictatorship in Pakistan, right? He supports all these Mujahideen going in Afghanistan to fight. India is terrified of this because they want to have a pro uh, India government in Kabul. Okay. Pakistan has always feared encirclement by India by having a pro India government in Kabul. So this policy has always been called strategic depth. Okay. Um, the other thing though, is ISI just, it's, it's like a mafia state to it. It runs, a, it smuggles a bunch of stuff across Afghanistan and Pakistan, mainly drugs as well, but weapons. Okay. People, um, there's a major economy here, which is connecting these groups too. And predominantly, again, this is, this is the area where the Afghan Taliban come from. It's a Pashtun based group. You have a lot of ISI high leadership is tied familially into these groups now. So it, it's, it's, it's a family matter basically. So it's not going anywhere. They can't break them off is what I'm saying. Um, but the main issue with Pakistan's foreign policy towards India is it's a weaker power. So it uses these types of Islamic extremist groups as an extension of its foreign policy. So a good example was 2008. Uh, the Mumbai attacks are by a group called, called Laskari Taiba, L-E-T, which uh, is very much a, a puppet of the government in Islamabad, but it's a terrorist organization. Uh, which Pakistan can use against India, uh, used to actually fight as well in Kashmir. So this is the issue with you know, a, a major dispute is Kashmir between India and Pakistan over whether or not it should be part of Pakistan or it should be part of India. It goes back to the, the founding of these two states and whether or not this predominantly Muslim area should be part of Pakistan, which is uh, considers itself the main South Asian Muslim state, which it is, right? Um, the Afghan Taliban then are seen by Pakistan as a way to exert influence over here to check India, uh, but as well, they wanted to establish trade routes uh, into from Central Asia into Pakistan. When Turkmen Bashi was in power in uh, Turkmenistan, the goal was to build pipelines uh, from this uh, Davlatabad uh, gas field down here, which would have run through Southern Afghanistan. And the US was interested with uh, Unical, was the company. That's a defunct company now, but Unical was trying to build these pipelines uh, through Afghanistan. And it just, you couldn't do it because of the war. And really, again, late 90s, Hillary Clinton's, you know, thinking about a Senate run in New York, uh, the issue of women's rights becomes an issue. So that's really, Hillary Clinton is the one who introduces this issue of how women in Afghanistan are being repressed, being forced to wear a burqa, beaten in the streets, stoned to death for allegedly committing adultery, um, not being allowed to go to school, not being allowed to read, not being allowed to go outside the house without a, a male companion who is a blood relative of theirs or their husband. I mean, an extremely restrictive interpretation of Sharia law. I'm not saying Hillary Clinton is by any means a feminist in the 1990s, uh, but she's the one who brings this issue up, which really started it. Um, going forward, um, the U.S. has a major defense industry interest with Pakistan. So Pakistan's always been very, despite multiple attempts by the U.S. government to try to entice or coerce Pakistan to abandon these extremist groups, never been able to do it. And I think it's just so tied in now. It's, it's interwoven into the state that it can't be done. So Pakistan, in that sense, is a dangerous actor from U.S. point of view in this part of the world. Uh, but I don't think it's really emboldened because of this. I really think China is the main winner out of this. Um, let, me, let me move down these questions as quickly as I can here. Sorry, I'm, Brian, I'm coming up on the end mark, I think. Uh, why the situation in Afghanistan can threaten diplomatic relations of Kazakhstan so much? I don't think it can threaten your diplomatic relations. I think it threatens your sovereignty long term, meaning long term. Uh, I think the U.S., Canada, Western Europe, we start to look at this part of the world and say it's useless. There's nothing we can do here. It's got oil and gas, which is going to run out. And there's a move in the West anyway to get away from oil and gas dependency. Um, small populations with no real influence in Western capitals in terms of policymaking, right? Massive Russian and Chinese influence over it. 
no history of democratization whatsoever, and a major pushback against uh, the interests of certain types of human rights today. Uh, this, this is women's rights, this is LGBTQ rights, this is rights of ethnic minorities. I mean, you, the US pushes this a lot, really since uh, mid Obama administration, uh, and I think the Biden administration will do this as well. This is part of their foreign policy. It does not track here. They don't want to hear it here. OK, and I'm, I, I'm object. I'm being agnostic on this. I'm not trying to say it's good or bad. I'm just saying this is what I see. What my government is pushing or trying to sell this part of the region of the world is not buying it. They don't want it. Um, for better or worse, I, I, I refuse to you know, say it's good or bad at this point. Uh, but the Russians and the Chinese, again, just look at your geography. They're right there. And this was one of the most shocking things I saw in 2014 when I started teaching here. Uh, Kazakhstani students were pro-Crimea annexation. And I thought to myself, why, why would you be pro-annexation of a brotherly Soviet nation uh, when easily you could get a piece of your country bit off by your northern neighbor as well. It doesn't make sense. And then the students start to say, oh, well, yeah, I, I guess I see your point. You have more to fear with Russia than you think. You get some nationalistic figures in the Kremlin with itchy trigger fingers. You got a problem on your northern border. So be aware of that. I, I, you know, this notion that uh, Russia is your best friend just because it's militarily allied to you, it's, it has a lot of influence over you. And the Chinese, you've seen what they're doing with the Uyghurs. So that, that and the Uyghurs are your cousins, right? And they're like the Tatars or the you know, Kazakhs. They're, they're very close to you guys. So uh, understand their interests are not your interests. So really what Kazakhstan should be focused on is maintaining your sovereignty to the greatest ability you can, diversifying your diplomatic relations and really appealing to international law because you need it. You, you want the international legal system to have have teeth behind it because the great powers don't seem to give a damn about international law. That's my country too. We violate international law on a daily basis. Uh, to what extent is it oof, risky uh, for Central Asian countries to accept refugees? I don't think it's risky. Uh, I think the people coming out are normal people. They're just like you and me. Um, I think it's a, a gesture of goodwill. There'll be some good diplomatic uh, payoff from it, but it's more an issue of uh, humanity. You know, the, these, do you think uh, your country should do it or not? Um, I'm fine with the Afghans uh, coming to America. I don't have any problem with them. I'm sure they will be fine upstanding American citizens. They'll pay their taxes. They will work. Uh, they will vote. And I'm sure they will uh, partially assimilate into the American culture and you know, partially maintain their Afghan roots. That's perfectly fine. That's what I, that's what every other group in American history has done. Uh, with this part of the world, I'm sure you'll have some, just like you have in America too, uh, you would have uh, some people who don't want it, uh, people who are fearful of it. Uh, and it, it's a difficult situation. I understand that because it's different culture, different languages. Uh, these people are much closer to God, I believe, in terms of their religion than... Uh, Kazakhs are, and that's mainly because the Afghans have been through a lot more difficult times than Kazakhstan. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a wondrous variety of people. It's a phenomenal country to understand. I love Afghanistan in many ways, so I, I, would, be, uh, I would be very happy to have Afghan students here, actually. Uh, I think there's one more question here I think I passed. Who now has control of the lithium mines? I read they were up to $1 trillion. Yeah, Afghanistan's got a lot of uh, untapped potential. So I don't know who's got control of the mines, but I would say the Taliban do if they're in control of it. But um, it's always this issue of, you know, can you tap it? And my hunch is this is what the Chinese are looking to grab too. So, I mean, it, this is a... Afghanistan is one of these countries where it's just kind of, uh, it's been pushed together uh, by, by, you know, historically you have the, uh, the Russian empire extending down into the 19th century into uh, the Central Asian republics and the British empire, the crown jewel of it being British India on the other side of it. So it's, it's never really been like a functioning state. It's always been like a buffer zone, so to speak. 
where tribes just dominate. So, I mean, this is one of the big problems why Afghanistan's never been able to realize its economic potential. It's remained very tribalistic. It's never been able to have a Western functioning style state in its borders. I think that was partially the American goal and it, it failed clearly. So maybe it's just some things are not meant to be, unfortunately. Um, one more message, Brian, we're coming right up on that mark. Right. So, okay. I'll so just this get, will be I'll the just... last, uh, last question and then we'll wrap things up here. Thank you for your lecture, Professor. Russia stretches all the way from Germany to Japan and this is a lot of territory. Well, the Eastern Bloc, that was the Soviet Union. Russia stops, <laughs> Russia is supposed to stop at the border of Belarus and Ukraine or Belarus and Donetsk, let's say. Um, this is a lot of territory. Would it really be interested in taking a bite off northern part of Kazakhstan? Sure, Kazakhstan's got money. Come on. <laughs> and plus, you got a bunch of ethnic Russians running around there. Um, is it possible? Anything's possible. Okay, but is it likely? No. Why? A um, couple reasons. One, what does Russia gain internationally by going after a peaceful country like Kazakhstan, not to mention one which is militarily aligned with it? You don't bite off a piece of your ally. You understand that doesn't look good, but uh, it is pot and Nazarbayev and Tokayev get along fine with Putin. So I don't see that as a problem. Uh, your country's understanding of the famines in the 1930s are different than the uh, understanding in Ukraine, you have no interest in join, joining the European Union or NATO. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons. And also you do what you're told for the most part with Russia. So I don't see any reason why they would want to do it at this point. But if you get nationalistic figures in the government, uh, it's, it's possible they could. And if they did that, there's not really much you can do to stop it because I don't think anyone would come to your defense. So that's why I'm saying you have to be very careful with your foreign policy towards Russia um, and understand if democracy, uh, you, you know what could possibly happen. Here's the other question you got to ask yourself. Do you think that the Russians were involved in suppressing your protests in 2019? It's very possible they were. They did. It's not they're going to march across the border, but to think that the Russian uh, government is not capable of sending in people so as to assist your government so as to maintain stability, come on, they could easily do that. Um, but understand that long-term, I think, yeah, Russia will more and more try to exert its influence over you. And it, it, Russians are smart, uh, the people in the government are smart, and I think they'll find a way to do it through various institutional layers, like a, like a parliament uh, in the Eurasian Union, and eventually then probably a single currency. And then Afterwards, who knows? I, I don't think it'll be as rough or as uh, crude as like a union state with Belarus. Uh, but nonetheless, I think eventually it will happen. I, do, I don't see anything stopping it. Okay, I think that's enough, Brian. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Charles, for your talk. Um, I will be sending out announcements uh, probably in the next couple of weeks for our subsequent talks. Uh, I'll try to do a better job publicizing these announcements to the broader university, but certainly through uh, SSH, uh, the listserv there. So uh, thanks again for uh, attending today, and I, uh, I look forward to seeing you in future talks.